Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our last session for today. Please take your seats as we are now about to start the panel, Let's Get Social. Gen Z, millennial investors in a world social trading and finferences. In this panel, you will learn more about social trading and finferences are changing the financial landscape, what are brokers' responsibilities when managing the content of their blocks and many more. Please welcome on stage the moderator, Mike Reed, the director at Pelican Exchange, who will introduce his panel. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, as, uh, um, uh, my name is Mike Reed. Um, and we, I operate a, or I'm a director in a company that specializes in, in social trading. So this is kind of my, uh, well, meant to be my expertise. Um, I'm joined by some excellent panelists. Um, obviously, we've got the last slot today. So thank you very much for all coming along. Um, I know they've saved the best to last, so we'll make sure this is very interesting and very lively. Uh, we're going to have some questions at the end, so um, if you just save your questions to the end. Um, so I'll start with Ritu. If you want to just work your way through, just give, it, give us a little background of who you are and why, you, why you're the expert in this space. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ritu, and I look after the retail business for Stonex. Uh, which is uh, in the financial services business, mostly in the broker, brokerage parts. And I look after regions of LATAM, Middle East, and what we call the rest of the world, which includes Southeast Asia, as well as Africa and others. Um, I think from a, from a business perspective, um, that is me. And you know, for our region, this topic is of great interest, and hence I'm here. Hello, everyone. My name is Stathis Xenos. I'm VP of Growth in ZuluTrade. We are one of the leaders of copy and social trading, and we are part of uh, Finvesia Group, which is a fintech-oriented group uh, based in India, London, Cyprus, Greece, and many other places. My experience in the industry counts more than uh, eight years. I used to be director of growth in a Greek broker, and after that, CMO at the fintech-oriented startup focusing on machine learning models. Thank you for being here with us, and let's hope that we'll have an interesting discussion. Hi, everyone. My name is Elena, and I'm business partner in company Armenotech. We have a few products, but one of our main focuses is actually technology. We provide for the brokers a technology that helps to socialize their trading, make it more social, and focused on the um, markets that are coming up now for new generations, as we're going to have a new topic today. Um, in general, I have a deep knowledge in psychology and working with teams and people, so that topic is quite good for us because uh, uh, new generations have new characteristics, new things that affected them in the uh, way they approach the world and the business and uh, financial activity. So um, I hope I will give some new insights for you guys how to manage that generation better and how to implement best technologies and solutions within your broker business. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Mo Padani. I work at Infinox um, for about eight years now, so hence you can see the gray hairs on my head. Um, so I work as a commercial manager and been focusing on mainly the APAC regions, um, such as building the business development team as well as the operations, ensuring that we are promoting the business, getting our brand out there, and we're doing what we can in the market. Thank you guys, the, uh, the esteemed panel um, I'm hopefully you can, you can hear us now after so having to compete with some pretty, pretty exciting events outside. Um, so just by way of background, I mean, I've been in the industry a little bit, and when we started out providing our solution, um, you had a you know, straightforward trading platform um, where people could obviously credit, credit capital to it, and then you could trade the markets. And then very quickly, you, you couldn't really have one of those without you know, a charting package, so that then became uh, a must-have. And then what's happened over the last three years is now you can't really launch a brokerage without some form of social system. So you've got to have some form of copy trading platform in there as part of the package. The, the, the current retail market looks at you, and if you don't have one, they'll just go to a broker which has a retail, um, has, has a copy trading solution. And that copy trading solution worked very, very well hand in hand with your influencer um, strategies and campaigns. They can go hand in hand. The problem about having a social trading platform is you can't just build the technology or license the technology and just power into any market. 
there, there has to be, some markets have very strict regulations. Certainly in the UK, the FCA have a very strict view on it. You have a specific license, Europe is the same. That's not the same with lots of other industries or other, other regions, but a lot of these other regions are now catching up and they are using the FCA as a guidance to how to actually legislate and regulate in these spaces. Um, I'm going to start with, with you, Ritu. So what, um, when you're thinking of working with influencers or, or these copy trading platforms, what part or what consideration do you give to the regulation within the region you're pushing into? Um, thank you, Mike. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting and relevant question um, for us uh, specifically because we are regulated um, across the globe, um, UK being one of them. So we have UK, uh, we also have US, um, you know, they are some of the strictest sort of regulators around the world. Um, while my region where I'm playing in, you know, LATAM and Middle East and um, Southeast Asia, uh, influences are big or copy trading is, is really big. Um, and it's a constant dialogue um, between us and our uh, legal and compliance team on, on this as to how do we do this and how do we go about uh, playing in this space. Um, and, and so far, one of the things we kind of agree on is that we have to stay away from the advice space. Um, we can, cannot be seen in any shape or form um, in, in the advisory space, right? Even if the people we are contracting with. The, the other thing we've agreed on, it's almost like a guide, guidebook, right? The other thing we've agreed on is every piece of content that goes out there, um, even if it's the influencer's content, um, initially it'll all be vetted by compliance. And I know it sounds really harsh because it, you know, you're kind of taking the freedom away from the whole piece, right? Um, however, we need to get comfortable with this um, because of this multi-jurisdiction approach. We sometimes have common compliance teams across the jurisdictions. So it becomes really hard to convince. And our approach as a business has been make our internal regulators comfortable and then push the boundaries. I mean, we'd never go into the advice space, but let's say in the content um, approval process, let's make sure that all the key pieces are approved initially. Uh, push them out there, see the response and how it goes, and then push the boundaries from there on. Do you, do you find when you're having to look at the content that is slowing down the process for the influencers? Because oh, the influencers want to get out there, they want to push themselves, but if it's got to come back to you guys and go, hey, we need to approve this first, do you find that, that they get a bit irritated? They're like, no, no, we want to go, 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 but... Absolutely. Um, it is because they're not used to that with some of the other businesses they work with, um, but it's a two-way process, right? They want to work with a brand like ours. They want to have that credibility. And you, you know, it's a branding is a two-way process. You give and take. Um, and at the same time, this is the limitation of working with us to a certain extent. Yeah. So it's not an easy one, but they also understand why they are having to do that. Yeah, interesting. I mean, staff this on that No, I mean, I know that Zulu were very quick out of the blocks. I mean, literally years ago, getting regulated in Greece. Is that correct? And that gives you European coverage. But do you find that your broker partners use that, or do they more focus on this of the offshore regions with, with the technology? Uh, first of all, Zulu Trade is uh, regulated uh, for the whole Europe through the Hellenic license. And we're also covering uh, the global part for uh, the other brokers. Now we are uh, acquired also the Dubai license. We are also reactivating our uh, Japanese because used to have, Zulu used to have a Japanese license in the past. And we are also very close to acquire our FCA license. So our uh, expansion plans include being licensed everywhere. I know that uh, regulation regarding especially influencers plays a crucial uh, and important role. And an example is uh, in January 2022, the Monetary Authority of Singapore banned the token holders, token providers, from providing and advertising their services to local people there. And in this way, the authority tried to protect people uh, with correlated uh, risks from cryptocurrency trading. I think that a uh, foreseeable trend here is uh, that regulation and regulators will not approve so easily 
unlicensed financial advisors. And uh, in order to include in your content financially oriented things, you have to be licensed. Yeah, I mean, certainly we found in the UK that, um, that the regulators, they didn't want the influencers to give the impression that they were independently regulated. And therefore, it's the responsibility of the broker or the social system being applied that allow, that, that has got to sort of monitor them and make sure that those are the rules. And we've, we've had um, some interesting conversations with the FCA about this. And it's interesting that we, we're based in London, but we're global. But it's, it's that that actually had that kind of premise or actually monitoring the content is what brokers follow all the way yeah. through, don't they? Yeah. I think it's becoming, it's almost like the KYC responsibility, right? Earlier it was okay. I was just having a conversation with one of my colleagues. Earlier it was okay if you onboard somebody who's been KYC'd with another entity. But over time, it's, it's your sole responsibility to know your customer. It doesn't matter who else knows your customer. Yeah. I think it's the same thing with the influencers um, now and, and the copy trading world as well, right? So. Absolutely. I mean, certainly, um, uh, you know, we've all seen a, someone post on Instagram a picture of a Ferrari, maybe a glass of champagne, maybe they're on the back of a boat, and they're selling their lifestyle. And then that is, I mean, it's so powerful, that continual imagery at trying to convert people to go, well, how do they get there? What do they do? Um, you know, and they go up, you know, you know, I'm on a copy trading platform or I'm on a, on a brokerage. So these people are trying to influence you to sell a lifestyle to convert across. And that, again, it it's, can be hugely misleading because guess what? They make all their money through their affiliate link, not actually through their trading. But that people don't know that. So, I mean, talking to you, Eleanor, I mean, we're looking at uh, when you do have an influencer and you are seeing... Um, then promote themselves in a way. I mean, how responsible do you feel? I mean, do you, do you look after the content and do you go, well, actually, hold on a minute, you can't show that picture of that amazing powerboat with that glass of champagne? Yeah, you're totally right. That can be a big problem. And to be honest with you, it's an ideal picture of the world. We do want to have uh, have a power over content that influence and influencers posting for us, especially if it's related to our brand, to our activity, or to our technology as it is. So there are actually a few ways, uh, as we know, uh, the new generation, they get all the information from social media. The generation that, that the millenniums, all they know, pretty much in area, every area of their life, it's social media. So the number one for us as a broker, for you as a broker, and us as a technology, any business really, is to have a strong social presence and of course to have an ability and hopefully technologically to monitor what is being posted, what is being said from your name, and especially if you're talking about the master traders or those who um, uh, advertise their trading activity as a way of making profits or creating that lifestyle or getting those emotions that we're talking about, right? They're chasing after uh, happiness, not really necessarily money, because what money is, it's just um, some kind of symbol of specific end result. And end result is usually emotion, is uh, something that uh, this person gets in exchange of certain activity. So uh, what do we do? Uh, as uh, in our company, we can provide provide, okay, there are different ways to do it. There is things uh, more complicated and more expensive uh, approaches to do so as, for example, to monitor every publication that your influencer does, which will take most probably a lot of human power. You would have to hire and pay high salaries, educate the team, which actual education is very important. You educate your people who work with those influencers. You educate uh, influencers yourself. You make sure they're using content, which is the whole team work, which is great, but again, uh, high cost uh, implemented in it. Uh, the other way is try to automize it in, in a way possible. And this way, uh, we thought of such thing as Web3 talking, when you can uh, tokenize, digitalize any trading activity of your trader, and to be able, and then you're able to control what within that token. So the influencer or master trader, he cannot come and advertise and say that his trading strategy and his trading is better than already is. So by posting that Web3 talking that specifically represents the trading activity of that master trader, the customer the end customer and can track it by clicking, let's say, a link or opening that token that actually represents all the graphs and all the history of it, which gives you a real picture of what's happening within that specific trader. So that Web3 tokens, they're also popular with the new generation because that's how it is. The new generation now uh, learns and uses, like uh, they know a lot about 
uh, crypto and all those solutions. So the Web3 token comes to be quite an interesting and useful solution for controlling your content and for generally even obtaining new markets. Like they can be eventually uh, posted on NFT marketplaces and you have more control over it. That's Yeah, I mean, certainly with the, some of the guys, um, the, the broker platforms that we, we work with, they identify agencies that then uh, link through to introducing to an influencer and therefore they kind of guarantee the quality because the agency is really representing them. That's been hugely effective because not only are these, these influencers high quality, um, so it's a kind of a niche industry that's just popped up. Are you finding that as well, Elena, that you're dealing with people will approach you to be an influencer or do you find that actually you go through an agency and then they find the influencers and then the quality is a bit better? Well, we do work with both of those sides. So we have specific brokers approaching us. We have agencies. We approach them themselves because, again, we'll, we would like to promote our product. Uh, the approach is different, and we have to customize. There is no one suit all, to be honest with you. And especially when talking about different markets, as uh, Reed to mentioned before, you have to be able to follow the regulator's rule. You have to be able to satisfy what the request, at least at the basic, uh, most important level. Then you can play and push the boundaries, but it has to be customized. There is no one. It's all approach. I think agencies are very useful if you're entering a new market. You won't know who are the influencers you, do, you should be looking at. And it's not enough to actually go and do some research. You need to rely on some expertise who's done this work for a while. So it definitely helps good tip, That's a good tip, that one. I think, I think that uh, it's better to handle it internally because uh, its company knows the product better than anyone. So it's better to approach experienced and let's say somehow... Uh, approved influencers out there. And uh, it's not only the regulatory perspective, but also the ethical perspective for the brokers. Uh, as Elena mentioned, this is happening either automatically or manually, uh, all this monitoring thing. And you have to be very careful which influencers you are going to cooperate with because you don't want to expose your own audience in such uh, dangerous conditions. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, because actually the influencers, I mean, I, we've been working with some brokers and they run media campaigns, which are expensive. Actually, we launched with one broker in the Middle East, and you know, in two days, they had 5,000 connected trading accounts. And we're like, well, you know, can you talk us through your campaign? We'd like to learn off it. And they said, one influencer, and they just all came. Um, so you really realize the power of an influencer can be incredibly effective as long as you obviously manage it and monitor it, monitor it well. And most often when you're dealing with influencers, it's not just go to this trading platform. It is, well, you can go there, but this is how I do it if you're not a trader and go and use a social trading system, a coffee trading extension to the broker I'm, I'm you know, working with. Um, and just moving on to you, Mo. So, you know, if they are being driven towards a coffee trading platform um, by the influencer, um, you know, are there ways that the broker can make the, the, the experience safer? The, the copy trading system can actually make it safer for the investor rather than saying, like, go and open an account, put some money in, um, and try and learn to trade in a very short period of time. You know, it's, that's nerve-wracking, whereas copying someone if that's the right person can be safer. Is that what you're finding? Um, well, touching back on, you know, in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, the FCA started implying some regulations. I think it was uh, MIFID II. And what happened was they were saying that a influencer or a partner must provide some enhanced ongoing service in order to receive some sort of commission back. So this, this kind of drive down the amount of influencers at the time because the FCI are always ahead of the game, right? So when it comes to copy trading, as it's a regulated product, what we want to do is ensure that the clients have the free remit and the ability to be able to see the full transparency of an app where they can see the performance, the profitability, the, the concentration of trades, open, closed, so they can you know, speak to one another on a social trading app as well as copy a strategy provider to help and benefit them. Now, as a broker, we need to ensure that we're transparent for our client base. We don't want them copying a, you know, a strategy provider that's not performing, so we provide that information. If they want to follow, they have that ability. And we, we don't prevent them, but we also give that ability for them to put a, like a drawdown or some sort of protection against their account. So once it reaches a limit, they can't lose what they want. They initially invested all of the, the whole amount. So it's important how we customize the app allocations, methods, and it's just become a very popular trend now amongst our retail base of clients. Excellent. No, so um, 
Yeah, I mean, certainly the, the you know, modern day social trading tools now do have all those safety measures in. So if you're looking to, I mean, let's, let's go back a few steps here. So if you're a new broker and you're interested in this space, we've learned that, yeah, be aware of regulation before pushing in. Um, you know, if you're going to go with influences, agency's best. Um, you know, if you're, and if you're, the social trading systems now should have, as Mo said, those safety measures in there. So you're going to guarantee longevity of account. They're not going to go in, put some money in, blow themselves up, and guess what they do? They'll go and whinge about you on social media. So if you can keep that account going for as long as possible, then a copy trading solution is, is, is really good at that, as long as it's, it's the right solution. So moving on to you, Stathis, you know, let's say these guys you know, are a new broker and they're interested in space. You know, what are the sort of do's and don'ts if you're looking at a copy trading solution? What are the tips that you could recommend when they're looking to put one together? Say, let's firstly say for a broker's perspective, it's very important to provide a, a credible copy trading solution. And what does it mean? It means that uh, you have to find a provider that uh, has proved all these years of existence that uh, is secure for the users. Also, it is very important to give proven track records. So this increases the credibility. You don't want, as a broker, to provide signals, random signals from uh, chat groups or telegram groups or whatever, which are, uh, let's say, somehow uh, dangerous for uh, your end user. So you have to be very careful uh, on the choice of the copy trading provider. From, en from uh, end user's perspective, it, copy trading, uh, of course, as I mentioned, you have to choose proven track records. Uh, through the engagement and uh, the whole social part, you are getting educated. So you are getting educated not only in social trading, but trading in general. And uh, last but not uh, least, it is very important. And uh, we have analyzed some internal road data that shown that people who use copy trading as a service are less exposed to risks rather than doing manual trading. So these are some, uh, let's say, best techniques. No, I mean, um, that's, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, certainly what we've seen is that, you know, if you're going to integrate a copy trading solution, that you need sort of the three buy-ins within the actual team itself. You've got sales buy-in, they've got to recognize the tool and go, yeah, this is great, and they can rec recommend it to their clients. You've got marketing, they've got to go and promote it, so they've got to believe in it too. And then the main stakeholder is the executive. Um, and I find that the, if you get those three all to work in harmony, then you, then you get a really good, really good experience for everybody. And it's very important uh, for a broker in order to be competitive, to provide something different, an extra feature, because out there are so many brokers with, let's say, having the same and the same uh, things to offer to the end user. So copy trading is a, a guide uh, that can be competitive, can be used in a competitive way for the broker, and also can increase dramatically the conversions. Some other data that we have analyzed from brokers that didn't have copy trading in the past showed that they increased their conversions by far, more than 40%, by adding copy trading as a service. Excellent. Okay, so it's data driven as well. So respond to the data, listen to the data, and then work out in a way you can improve and fine tune your experience. Um, obviously, copy trading it works to appealing to different generations. So the classic trading experience is people that actually want to trade their own markets um, and make their own decisions. But obviously, copy trading appeals to people that don't know and can just copy somebody else. That then opens up another market, um, and 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 that's. That w that's what we're finding quite interesting. It's the younger generation going, well, we don't have to be experts because, hey, there are some experts out there. Um, Mo, I mean, in terms of targeting this younger audience, I mean, do you have, you know, are you recognizing that there's a slight different demand from those type of from younger generation coming through? Um, well, to be fair, right, with the younger generation now, copy trading has become really influential. Uh, to be able to trade, you need to have a bit more experience, you know, your knowledge and experience in the industry with what's going on in the financial markets, any political news, natural disasters, all affect the market. So if you're on a copy trading app, it gives you the ability and also the confidence to follow a strategy provider, which is fundamental now in this game because 
everyone's got a full-time job, right? So it's hard to be, uh, be able to understand what's happening in the market. So when you're downloading an app and you see all of these strategy providers, you have the ability to copy them and make some profit here and there, right? And actually, we've just, when, when I say we just, about a year and a half or two years ago, we've introduced an app called iX Social. So now this enhances clients to have the confidence to be able to make some profit. And at the same time, if they, if they feel uncomfortable with the app, they have the free remit to close the trade, follow another strategy provider, or go back to self-trading. So it's not like your typical MAM or PAM where you're invested into this managed account and you can only close out once the manager closes out. This is more of a social trading app where you communicate with your peers, you, you're on the same page, you gain that confidence and understanding, and you're on the same path. And it really helps the clients invest more into, into our brand because that transparency, that, that support that we provide is fundamental. So yeah, I think that's the main target right now, especially in Asia, dealing with a lot of the regions here. They are very highly influenced in copy trading. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, the, the vibe is that it's speed, isn't it? People want an immediate reaction, immediate response. I think that may be a little unfair on this younger generation. But you know, the gratification and response you know, to become a good trader is, takes years of experience, and you may all get it wrong. Um, but that's of instant demand. I mean, Richard, have you found that you, know, you need to give them into gratification, therefore a copy trading solution possibly is a slightly more palatable product for them than actually saying, hey, here's a platform, go and learn to trade? Um, uh, definitely. I mean, if you, if you look at the trends, then definitely copy trading is something that is appealing to the younger lot. What we call, uh, what Mo was describing actually earlier, as the people who are less experienced in trading, um, this is something that they find easy to do and go ahead with it. Um, however, would they stay like that? for a long period of time. I think maybe, maybe a section of them will, but I would expect a lot of them to mature into independent traders. Um, so copy trading might be more of an introductory sort of uh, module for them, uh, you may call it that. However, on the other side, if you look at the mature trader, um, which I think is important because we talked about risk, right? That we are reducing risk um, through copy trading. Um, for a mature trader, there are other tools to reduce your risk. Um, and, and those are the traders I think that every broker really wants. Um, you, wh where is your revenue generation coming from, right? It's the, it's the person who has the wealth, who knows how to trade, who knows how to create the wealth from trading. Um, and there is something that we offer is, 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 an, is a tool which we call performance analytics. Um, there are other companies who offer it as well. Um, however, it, it goes into the psychology of trading and it goes into the analysis of your own trading. And basically, it shows you what your trading pattern has been like and it actually uses AI um, and, and machine learning to actually get you to understand your own trading pattern. Where are the pitfalls? What is your strength and what's your weakness? And, and that actually can help you in trading better and trading with much less risk um, and making sure your strategy is working more often than not. So it's, it's, it's a mix. That's so interesting. You, you'd actually like to see them go from copy trading and migrate all the way across to making their own decisions. Absolutely. And then they become a longer client. That's ultimately what is you want a client to keep reinvesting even when they've lost and also become active ambassadors for what you're doing. So if you can keep them happy and positive, even sure. though they may not be ultimately succeeding, then, then they become a really good, useful asset to you. So, you know, the old days when you used to try and win them over and blow their account up and you b-book them. It's, yeah. like, it's interesting. That's all changed now, hasn't it? And it gave the industry a bit of a bad rep. And it's interesting that you're all saying, actually, we want to look after the client because Absolutely. it's in our interest. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of, um, I don't know, I was going to go back to you. Um, when you've got an influencer um, and you're trying to work with them, um, are there any do's and don'ts, things you would avoid um, and things you would actively get them to do um, to make sure that you maintain a, a really strong relationship throughout? Well, yes, for sure. And that's all related to what all the previous speakers have said before. It's to make sure the rules are followed. That's a big don't not to post the information that is not true to begin with. Very simple. Nothing very complicated. They have to be able to use the same social platforms, the same tools that you guys are implementing. You have to be able to... Actually, the uh, tool that the two mentioned, that sounds like a good uh, control um, 
um, tool to see for the influenza how they're doing and for the company actually to monitor their own activity if they're improving or not. So ability to understand that technology and use that technology uh, within uh, the activity on everyday trading is very important. And of course, they need to be able to trace their own activity through other platforms like Google, like Facebook, whatever they're using, likes, dislikes, reacting on their followers. Um, reactions as well, utilizing in their trading activity. Uh, also, we need to make sure that uh we understand the psychology of those who are the following um, uh, your traders, master traders. As we men as I mentioned before, uh, thinking of psychology is the uh, number one step of uh, getting the right uh, tool set for uh, each of us to be equipped. Uh, we need to remember that uh, the Gen Z is the first generation that grew up with their phones in their hands. They never knew anything else, and that's what they're going to be using for pretty much the rest of their lives. They have the trust in crypto. They're the first generation, one of the gen millenniums as well. They have the most amount of uh, financial, um, like of money basically uh, to invest, but they have very little knowledge as Mo also mentioned. They want to invest, they would like to invest, but they don't know how. So they will copy, they will follow. So educational part is very important. That's a must to educate your, your influencer. And again, going back to technology by tracking the activities, uh, tokenizing the activity and making sure it's transparent for both of you as a company, as a influencer and as a, uh, a client that at the other the end is a must-have uh, thing. And I think a great dawn here, even uh, if I'm not a Gen Z, but I think I'm a millennial yet. Uh, I think that a great oh, don't is the overpromising, not overpromising. So in this way, you can reduce the risk that you expose the end user. I think yeah, I mean it's saying like Ellen is saying that that you uh, yeah you've got to you've got to really monitor and actively. You know, your team's got to buy into what's going on and monitor it. That's when you get the most out of it. And then, yeah, as, as, as you're saying, yeah, you've got to make sure that, um, you know, that, that, that you know, you know yeah, they've got to be realistic with their targets. You know, you can't just, you, you can't just say, well, you're going to be rich overnight and you're going to be buying a new Ferrari like, like this person on this image. So, and if you can do that, then you're going to have a good relationship and have good, good impact. Um, we get this every so often, and I've seen people dabble in it. Um, there was actually a Bucks, I think, was a social app that launched in Europe. They had a gamified approach to engaging with this younger generation. And that kind of set the scene. And they've done incredibly well. And I think they're a good app. But actually, no one's followed suit. I was wondering, um, Stathis, if you've seen with Zulu that you've been tempted to be drawn into this gamification element to try and get this younger, younger generation to, to buy in um, to, to your solution. Uh, with Zulu, we're trying to enable gamified elements, but in a very careful way. What does it mean? It means that uh, we all know about the Robinhood case. Uh, Robinhood was heavily fined from uh, the, America, the US regulator for manipulating their own users by providing them a gamified approach, approach and making them to lose money. So with Zulu, we are very careful. We're going to handle gamification in a very careful way in order to provide it through engagement, because we strongly believe that the, engagements leads, the engagement leads to education. So in this way, users are getting educated better, not only for copy trading, but trading in general. Uh, regulators have already raised the red flag for uh, gamification, and they are very close to evaluate many cases. So we believe in a gamification, but uh, simultaneously, we're very careful. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I'd like to go off a little bit off script here and just say, everyone in the audience, could you put your hand up if you think adding a gamified aspect to a brokerage is a good thing? So there's, so there's four or five of you. So not, yeah, not that many. And it's interesting. Maybe it's just not been done particularly well at the moment, but certainly what we found with some brokers is, is that trading money is serious, it's real money, it's not a game, and therefore if you add in a bit of a game to it, you possibly miss out on the heavier weight, big accounts that we all kind of, we all strive to try to convert. Um, I mean, Stathis, is that what you find? However, another statistic has shown that uh, companies that have enabled gamified elements in their product have uh, dramatically increased their conversion rates by more than 700%. That's a fact, great. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so there it is. I, I think there is a, 
there's more of a balance between when how you do the ga gamification, isn't it? It's more about user experience and the learning aspects of it. And of course, the regulator is concerned. But as long as we don't sort of tread into the realm of advice or leading them down to the trading parts of it, I think that's where the balance would be. And uh, that's where the engagement comes from as well, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So you've got to get it, get the balance right, but it shouldn't tip too much into this kind of fruit machine style, whiz pops and bangs, the kind of candy crush stuff, because that then will turn people off. Um, Come to our last 10 minutes, we've got one more question that I'd like to ask the panel. Um, going to you, Eleanor, I mean, it's a bit of a strange question, this, but um, do you find there are key events you know, during the year or that you have led you to, to, to start to use or influence the campaigns that you have with social trading um, you know, and, and with the use of influencers? Well, that's a perfect question right into the topic we're just uh, discussing at the moment, the gamification. The truth is the COVID affected all of us and not just uh, this industry. And the newer generation is more so because as research proven, they're a little bit more sensitive and emotional level than the rest of us, let's say, uh, uh, those who live through already economical crises, for them it's the first one, and they're younger. So their psychology, their brain is not really able and ready, was ready to manage that. Being locked up in the house, have all this limitation, uh, negative emotions, now we're having a political crisis out there. So all of this creates their very big impact and they uh, feel very frustrated. And what we as a, any type of business and brokers can provide is an, uh, try to counteract and counterbalance that negative emotion with positive. And again, gamification doesn't have to be in a way what we've seen with Robin Hood. It can be related uh, to awards that brings you not um, satisfaction related to profits only, but satisfaction with your own achievement within that platform, within that area of business. If you're talking about education of how to trade, how to invest, you can create, for example, different levels of achievement. You can be level one, two, three, will not be monitored. It will be all fully, completely your psychological achievement and uh, uh, value that you have carry within yourself and when you post it as a fin flares on your social media you let's say you have a badge or you have a token again or you have any other digital asset on an nft for example that tells you great you achieved that level now you're this this and that you possess this kind of information and you're able to let's say uh, do different activities within that industry so that's a great positive reinforcement that's a great um, impact that this person will have for his own psychology and it's a additional value they add to themselves as a successful, hopefully, master trader. So those are one of the things, and that's what we added to our campaigns and what we try to promote uh, in, amongst our clients and within ourselves as well. So actually, it's very fast of changing news like, you know, COVID, or I think it was Game Group that caused Robin Hood to, to blow up in the end, didn't it? Uh, or certainly caused it problems. If you're dynamic with your campaigns and use your influence as well, you can actually position them around these events, and that can re win you respect and also drive business. Is that what you're finding, Ellen? Is that, is that what you found? Uh, sort of, yeah. It's y yes and no. But again, that's... Um the most important is to look after that end result that people will get, the emotional uh, confidence, uh, those end result they get. Like, you need to look what's it's do, what are we doing this for? What are they doing Trying to achieve, for? exactly, yeah. okay, interesting. I mean, I certainly, we certainly noticed, um, I don't know, actually, Stathis, you're the same, but we certainly noticed that there was a big tick up in interest in what we were doing after um, eToro. I think that they did some kind of, um, uh, um, sort of, uh, sort of uh, they raised some capital, I can't remember what it was called, in America, and they raised capital at about 11 billion. So that valuation suddenly put what they were doing on the map. So, you know, and obviously that, that combined system that they have, suddenly, you know, the big brokers and all these people out there going, hold on a minute, how have they got that valuation? And if that valuation is driven by what they present as a copy trading solution, then should we be actually trying to achieve that? And that suddenly became very relevant to us, and suddenly the phones started ringing quite, quite aggressively. I don't know if you did you find that with you, Stathis? I think that the valuation has probably come from marketing uh, approach probably, and not from the core product. Mm -hmm. And uh, the issue here is that you have to focus on the product and put the best of your efforts there. And of course, marketing is uh, definitely correlated to this, but let's focus on the product and the user experience. So if you keep a good product and you, you, know, and you work well with, you know, with your influencers, it's a good quality product, then it's going to work anyway. And you're going to get some good, good results. And uh, you have to upgrade all the time your product and uh, release new features uh, in order to give uh, this uh, unique experience to the end user. 
We, as a company, Zulu Trade, we're very close to release the Zulu Trade.0, which will be our new platform, and hope to give uh, an ultimate experience for uh, the investors out there. Excellent. Thank you very much. Great. Coming to the last five minutes, um, I was just going to see if anyone had any questions for the panel um, that you like. So if you want to put your hand up, we'll, um, we'll, 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 we'll apply them to the panel. No questions. Ah, we've got one. Amazing. Sure, I'll fill in a question. Uh, Alan, I touched on it, but you talked about gamification in social trading. So where do you draw the line between marketing, trading, and the rewards in gamification? Or do you? And, where, and better question, where do the regulators draw that line? I suppose what, you know, yeah, that's a good question because obviously everyone's, well, they can be subject to the financial promotion rules. A financial promo promotion rules are very specific and you've got to make sure that, you know, compliance teams are monitoring all the time. Um, I don't know, Ritu, whether you, you, well, you can think, well, you know, where if you're trying to, within the gaming world, you could probably have more flexibility in it. But if it's ultimately falling back on, uh, you know, a, a regulated product, then you're, you're going to blend into two worlds, aren't you? And how do you tread that? How do you tread that? Yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, the difference would be, again, what's your objective? Um, you, one would need to define, and we would define the objective of that particular experience. Um, and that could, that cannot be trading. But that's something which you have to stay away from, because that, that absolutely takes you bang into the regulatory minefield there. Um, however, if it is education um, engagement, then, then it is fine. You can actually do that. And even reward for education or actually um, your performance, but in a backdated manner, that is okay. Um, again, I would refer to the whole sort of experience on understanding your own performance and setting up, let's say I set up a trading strategy for myself and I actually kept to that strategy or that level of discipline, whatever risk level I assigned to, then having a badge as a reward is fine. But then promoting something that if you trade X, then you will get that reward, that's not fine. Absolutely. I think that's the, that's the difference. Yeah, interesting, because you're right. I mean, you know, that is, a, is a superficial badge on a screen the same as a promotion saying, you know, you trade three times, you get, a, you know, you get an extra bonus, which is outlawed now in, in the UK and Europe. So actually yeah. that badge thing, what is it? If it's just a superficial badge, then is it okay or possibly not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you think of video games and how how rewards get unlocked after you've played a certain amount. And, and that's where it gets tricky with trading, right? You cannot unlock things because, just because somebody traded X level. Yeah, um, absolutely. Personally, I believe that uh, it is still a gray area for the regulators. And uh, it comes when you have to define the level of um, how this is uh, risky for the end user and uh, the exposure that uh, it's going to have. Robinhood uh, providing through, let's say, rewards and confetis after successful trades, that kind of gamification that was addictive for the end user and had as results to lead them to lose more money. So I think uh, it has to be defined from the local regulators and depending also on the asset, not only on the regions. Well, I think you also have to remember, as well as regulators, which rules are set ground and we have to follow them. The uh, brand image, the imaging of your brand is very important. So here you are yourself deciding who you want to be. You want to be a responsible broker or the broker who trades in the gray area. So it's also to your marketing department, actually not marketing, your heads and your leaders who are with you in this business need to decide who you want to be and what rules you want to follow. Uh, the laws are there. You can always, always or not, there are always ways to, let's say, overcome or modify or manipulate the rules. But it's up to you what kind of brand you want to be, what kind of trader you want to be. That's pretty much the uh, underlining that brand altogether. positioning, yeah, yeah, absolutely important. So, yeah, so how, yeah, how do you want to position yourself? You know, I suppose if you're an older brand, then you know, do you now suddenly want to jump, and then does that reflect well on you or not? So that's a bit of a debate internally. We've probably got time. Sorry, I've got one more thing to say. Um, I I would say I'm pretty much on the fence of gamification. Um, you know, as exciting as it is and appealing it is for the for the clients, um, does it really keep in line with a high risky product? 
um, you know, if it doesn't get managed or handled correctly, things can go very wrong. And, you, and it's very difficult with the social space and the internet being so huge to be able to keep in, in, in line with the content that is going on. So we, it's, it's, it can be a bit of a touch and go. So I wouldn't, I'm a bit hesitant on the gamification on the side. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, everyone's a little bit unsure how efficient it is and whether it is actually beneficial. Probably got time for literally one more question. Does anyone have one more question? Last question, last question of the day. Thank you, hello. Um, I think the younger generation seems to care more about ethical investing, about the environment. They potentially have a, a sort of solid moral compass. And um, this industry isn't necessarily associated with, um, you know, strong ethics or the environment or um, reducing our carbon footprint, for example. Do you feel like you need to market your product differently to appeal to that, um, to that younger generation? It's a good question, because obviously if you take a, a flight these days, a little button pops up and says, uh, do you want to sort of offset that? Um, you know, and you know, when, if you go and buy some clothes, you might get a chance to sort of you know, donate some money to planting trees. What is our industry doing in that space, given obviously uh, uh, you know, it is implied that our generation, the older generation, are not quite as moral as the younger generation? Um, Probably correct. Um, but does anyone have any thoughts on, on whether that should be something that our industry actively engages in or whether actually it's, it's sort of not yet or not ready for it? Um, I, I think it's, um, it's early days for the industry. But you do see a similar move in, in the sense of you see certain sort of move towards ESG across all of the big brokers that are out there, um, as well as you have the thematic funds that are now available and, and you can um, invest um, in, in a socially conscious way towards certain types of industries um, or, or asset classes that, that you think would, would, be, would, a younger generation, would appeal to a younger generation person. Um, at the same time, I think there is a lot more that can be done. So that's why I'm saying it's early days. There's a lot more we could do. You, you could, you know, in, in, even in the derivative world, you can showcase the exact sort of carbon footprint as you were just mentioning, as to if you invest in this uh, group of assets, what's the carbon footprint that you are looking at and how would you offset it? Here is another um, set of investment that you could do to offset it. I mean, but I think there is a way to go. Um, yeah, it's interesting, us. we've actually launched a product um, uh, and actually the response from our brokers, and it is about, literally about this, and, and the response from the, product, uh, from the brokers that, that use our product, is slightly varied, you know, because essentially what, what it does is it does take a little bit away from their margins and they, they're, not, they're not jumping at it and they don't necessarily see it necessary. But I think there will be like a watershed moment because right. one broker will do it and then they'll all follow. So over the next sort of 18 months, I think actually we're going to see that this industry has to do what everyone else has done, which is, you know, give a nod and a wink to you know, we've all, wherever you've come from we're in the world, everyone's had the hottest summer on record. And yeah. you know, people are waking up to the fact that this thing is real and we've got to do something about it. So I think you'll start to see the industry start to shift, but it's not quite happening yet, is it? And that may be because there isn't a product right there, but, um, but it's interesting to see that, yeah, it probably will start to happen because it won't I be the only one out there being the outlier. I agree. I think it's evolving and it will follow um, the other industrial trends on this as well. Thank you, panel, very much. Can I have a round of applause Thank for the panel? Guys. They were brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.